In this podcast, I'm sharing my passion and curiosity for soft robotics, where we share inspiring stories about the work we do and how we can push the limit. I am Mara Dweeney, and this is Soft Robotics Podcast. Support for this show comes from Science Robotics Journal. I really find Science Robotics to be a great resource for reliable and tangible research where we can really push the limit of the science we do in robotics. Great way to stay up to date with the published article is checking out the released monthly issue. All the links will be included in each episode description. We will also happen to have a regular conversation on the most published science robotic articles where also you can contribute with your question and thoughts about their research. Thanks Science Robotics for sponsoring Soft Robotics Podcast. I'd like to ask you first how you'd like to define who you are for maybe audience first time listening to you, who you are. Um, so I would consider myself as a, a material scientist uh, who is very interested in um, finding, uh, I would say, some material secrets from natural systems. Um, so we like to ask questions from uh, uh, natural uh, or biological materials uh, systems uh, like shells, teeth, uh, bones. Um, so, yeah, um, material scientist uh, who is very interested in uh, nature. <laughs> awesome. Actually, I found your research, to be honest, very interesting. And I'm really passionate about um, the design of different material classes that can give us certain functionality. And I may mean, I ask you at the beginning, when you look to evolution in nature, what kind of things do you think very inspiring to you that makes you work and what you do now in designing material? What kind of interesting stuff do you think very inspiring in nature? Yeah, there, there are many aspects, uh, I would say, but the most uh, uh, striking or most intriguing part is the is a complex three-dimensional structure at a different length scales um, from biological materials. Mm -hmm. um, so, if, for example, if you look at teeth, um, our teeth is made of a very brittle, uh, very weak m mineral, uh, hydroxyapatite. But um, but the teeth can last for lifelong, right? Uh, for 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 our we can use teeth for for our life. Um, the reason is because it has a very complex internal microstructure, which is where the uh, the mineral particles are are arranged in a very complex three dimensional way. Um, so all the mineral rods are organized um, in, in, in a very complex in, interdigitating uh, uh, fashion, which gives the materials high strength and toughness. Um, um, this kind of uh, three-dimensional structural control currently cannot be achieved, uh, I would say, synthetically. So we cannot fabricate uh, those kind mm -hmm. of materials. Um, so that's always fascinating uh, to me, um, to look into how the structure is constructed, right? how, how, what is the final uh, microstructure uh, in 3D, and how that structure is formed. So those are two different questions, right? What is the final form? And how that form uh, um, uh, achieved through the formation process? Um, and then finally, can we learn, uh, can we understand their design and, um, and then fabricate or manufacture similar materials? So those mm -hmm. are, uh, I would say, the, the most intriguing question to me, how nature uh, does that. <laughs> and I also saw your work also in seashell, like inspiration from seashell. And also you work with Mark Myers, I, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, and our biome fish. We, did, we didn't directly work with, uh, I didn't dir uh, directly work with Mark M Myers. Uh, he is a, he's a ver he's an outstanding, I would say, uh, researcher in this area. Um, we yeah we uh, we studied their papers uh, we will uh, so we have some overlaps in, in some areas um, um, but currently we don't have direct uh, uh, collaboration. And what is the secret when you look to you mentioned the teeth and also the seashell you mentioned uh, also one of your research seashells. What is the secret? For example, I found fascinating for uh, fish for example one of the toughest and flexible biological material. How you can combine something? tough and flexible in one structure. Yeah. What's the secret? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's um, that's a very specific, I would say, very very good example how um, um where nature uh, does it very well, <laughs> combining <laughs> flexibility and protection. Um, so we have a work uh, uh, two years ago, I think, um, looking at how uh, a mollusk um, uh, con uh, achieves flexibility and protection through a s uh, assembly of uh, ceramic scales. So this mollusk, this seashell is called chitons. Um, so uh, it has eight plates uh, instead of one or two. Um, it have eight overlapping plates, and uh, surrounding this large eight uh, plates, there are uh, a, a region or, or so-called girdle, which is uh, very soft, uh, covering the rim of this shell. And the, the girdle, on top of the girdle, is covered by the girdle scales. Those scales, it looks like uh, fish scales, but it's, uh, it's much thicker, uh, it's completely mineralized. Uh, you have that means you have a very thick, very protected uh, uh, outer layer, top layer, but because of the scale, it's also very flexible. So, I would say in general, the um, to achieve flexibility, the um, uh, using scaled armor is is uh, a very common strategy in nature. I mean that that's also true for. Some human armors, right? The uh, the chain, uh, the the male chain, uh, the male uh, uh, armors, right? Um, um, yeah, using uh, discrete uh, uh, armor units uh, and then placed on a flexible substrate. I think this is a common strategy. There are also other, uh, I would say, strategies uh, where we were also investigating into. Um, I think it's a, it's a good placement of um, uh, hard and soft materials in the same system, where in that case you don't clearly see individual scales, but you still see a district domains of hard and soft. Um, so there, there are very good examples of, um, from other systems. Um, I'm not sure if you know um, Dr. Mason Ding. Um, mm -hmm. He is a... Um, He's a, I would say, evolutionary biologist, uh, marine biologist, and also material science scientist. So he, his expertise is in um, the shark uh, or cartilage-based uh, um, uh, fish. Um, so, for example, in shark, their their cat their skeleton is made of uh, um, cartilage, mineralized cartilage. In that case, you have uh, highly mineralized domains embedded in the soft cartilage uh, matrix. And it allows some flexibility, but at the same time, those tiles, those hard tiles, can can uh, uh, can bump into like uh, get contact into each other when you bend or uh, um, uh, mechanically load the structure. So it is both flexible and and, um, and hard. Uh, I would say we have some collaborations mm. looking at the how the the um, the. The organism control the local mechanical properties within the individual tiles, where you can see uh, the animal really can control the mineral deposition in different positions to control the local mm. mechanical property in order to achieve this uh, flexibility as well as the um, the rigidity at the same time. Mm, this is interesting. So before going to the building blocks you know, for this kind of a structure, hard and soft to achieve body <coughs> armor or high toughness. I guess that's you. Do you think in the field in general do you, to exhibit physical intelligence should be through the material or architecture? Because we hear speak about architecture in a in a fascinating yeah. way yeah. to do yeah. intelligent behavior to protect the body. And yeah. which one's significant you mean, to you? Yeah, you mean from from which which perspective? From the animal, like from the organism perspective, or from us? I I think this is um. Yeah, this this is a great question. We're we're uh, we're working on actually two review papers trying to address your question. Um, so, w which one is important? The the 3D architectural design or the material itself, or the intrinsic material itself, right? Um, we think both. Uh, at least from what what we uh, have seen uh, from the literature, um, um, we think both. Uh, so nature uh, controls both the 3D architectural organization of the mineral building blocks. So they're organized in a complex way, in teeth, in shells, in bones, um, in sponges, right? 
you always see very complex uh, internal microstructure in order to achieve uh, toughness. Uh, at the same time, if you look at the uh, intrinsic uh, microstructure of the individual building blocks, so now uh, you just focus on the, uh, the mineral building blocks, uh, individual building blocks, and the internal building microstructure is different from the, uh, let's say, the pure uh, calcium carbonate or hydroxyapatite. Uh, with, uh, or the calcium carbonate. They are different. Um, mm. uh, the, the, there, there are a lot of microstructural features, for example, uh, within the, the calcium carbonate mineral building blocks in seashells, you have, um, for example, so-called intracrystalline organic materials where the uh, nanoscale organic uh, inclusions are embedded within the mineral matrix. And mm. um, you may also have some trace elements a lot of uh, uh, mollusks incorporate, for example, calcium, uh, uh, sorry, uh, magnesium inside the calcium carbonate matrix. So you have a doped uh, calcite crystal. So that's true also for echinoderms uh, like sea urchins, starfish. Uh, they, they do that uh, very often. Um, you may also have other features, for example, some residual string within the mineral uh, building blocks. Uh, I would say that's also fascinating. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of others. Um, so at both uh, 3D structural level as well as the intrinsic uh, uh, crystalline level, uh, nature has, uh, I would say, tools. They have a toolbox to control this, this structure features at these two different length scales in order to, to enhance the mechanical properties. So that's why uh, if, if you measure the mechanical properties of the biological calcite, versus the geological calcite, they are different. Um, they are different uh, uh, pro mechanical properties. Uh, mm. Yeah, so um, although uh, they look like the same, uh, they, they, uh, I would say 99% of the composition is <laughs> calcium carbonate, but uh, the mechanical properties are different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and let's ask you about the building blocks. There's a combination now of soft and hard, and this weaker connection to do this trick to protect the body. But when you look to different creatures or even in inspiration, what is the right combination? Do you think, because I don't know if you agree, we don't have like a methodology. What is the ratio for the stiff bar to soft bar? What is the right ratio to maintain this rigidity and also do the trick as well? I don't know how do you see this combination yeah, ratio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think this really depends on the functional requirements. Um, so, it, for example, if you look at our teeth, right, so the, the top part is enamel. Um, so a lot of uh, the majority, 99% of the enamel is mineralized. So there are very minimal amount of organics. Uh, but if you look at the inner side, which is denting, um, so it's less mineralized. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so the, it's almost like a, bone, uh, like a bone, right? So the mineral content for bone is about 70% in terms of weight. Um, so the, the reason is because uh, for the enamel, you want to have a uh, very hard, very, very well resistant uh, property uh, because it's direct contact, uh, let's say, with, with food. Um, where damping provides the uh, cushion, for, uh, provides uh, accommodation for deformation, right? Um, and also other biologic functions, maybe for, for, uh, for heating or for... for uh, sensing, right? So in that case, um, in different requirements, uh, will will control our, it will dictate the the mineralization degree. The same mm. the same is true for I would say for uh, other biological materials uh, for mollusks. Uh, most of the mollusks, if you look at the naked structures, is um, roughly ninety five percent is is a mineral. Um, um, five percent is organics. Um, right, so in that case, you have uh, high mineral content in order to achieve uh, high uh, strength. Um, mm. But um, if you look at the uh, some other shells, uh, like the external layer of, uh, let's say, abalone shell, which is uh, prism based, um, so in that case, the organics uh, content is even less in order to achieve the uh, abrasion resistance or wear resistance. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I would say depending on the function, um, 
and another, I would say, good example is um, so a couple of years ago when I was still uh, postdoc uh, at Harvard, we discovered um, a, a mollusk, uh, which is also a chitin. Uh, that chitin, uh, that particular chitin has, uh, has eyes uh, embedded on their shells. So, so meaning that you have <laughs> a mineralized <laughs> shell uh, equipped with uh, many, many small eyes. Those eyes are made of minerals. So that's very different from like our uh, other uh, eyes in nature. Uh, it's made of aragonite, a, a form of calcium carbonate. So the same mineral for um, made for the for the shell. But if you look at the microstructure of the eye versus the normal shell, the eye is is highly mineralized, very minimal amount of organics. It's almost like a single crystal, although there are some some misorientations. But um, it's it's highly mineralized. The reason for that is um, um, you reduce the, the, um, the amount of a secondary phase, right? So you don't have organics to cause the optical scattering, right? So that the light can go through the lens, which is very homogeneous, um, so that they can focus the light to form an image. So that depends on that particular optical requirement in order to, uh, to have that low organic content mineral versus the normal uh, shell where you want to have protection, right? So um, it depends on the the functional requirement, I think. Mm. Mm. I think also another interesting um, point about damage localization. Damage localization. Oh, yeah. How it happened yeah. to localize the damage? To if you can explain, it's like arresting damage and make it in one area, right? That that what you mean yeah, about yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How it happened? So, yeah. Um, I was in, in general when when you when the material uh, uh, respond to a mechanical loading, right? Especially in a in a like high speed or impact loading, you, you had the material need to uh, deform uh, in order to uh, dissipate the the kinetic or mechanical energy uh, input from let's say the projectile or from the impact, right? Mm -hmm. So that means the material need to deform. Uh, undergoing through the the so-called energy dissipation process to 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 absorb that amount of kinetic energy so there there are different ways right so you may have a material which can uh, which can uh, let's say uh, undergo a large area of deformation so that the energy can this can be dissipated in a large volume a large area uh, so that's good to in terms of dissipating uh, the the amount of energy because you involve more material to absorb that material, uh, that energy, but if for some uh, uh, applications, you want to localize that damage um, while you absorb the energy, especially for for let's say a transparent armor, right? You don't want to have the entire transparent window to be uh, damaged because you cannot see through. So at that for that particular application, you want to localize the damage and also uh, absorb energy. Um, so the, the, one of the works uh, that we did, uh, that we discovered in the in the seashell, um, uh, the way that the, that particular shell, placuna placenta, um, how it, it, it achieves that this uh, this uh, I would say energy absorption and def, uh, damage localization is through their nanoscale deformation mechanisms, particularly through so-called deformation twinning. So this deformation twinning is a, is a is a mechanism where the crystal can shift its orientation under loading. So when you, when there's an impact or where the indentation coming into the material, the crystal will shift its orientation to form uh, 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 the turning boundaries. Those turning boundaries uh, you can consider them as a barriers in the crystal. So those those barriers will uh, contain the def uh, deformation, so it will restrict the propagation of the uh, damage into larger area. At the same time, those training can absorb energy. It can also um, uh, induce other type of deformation mechanism. For example, uh, when training happens, it can open up the, the layers between the minerals uh, slightly. Through this process, it can uh, start to stretch the organic materials between the mineral layers to dis to absorb m more energy. So this deformation twinning uh, acts as a barrier at the same time um, dissipate energy and also catalyze uh, other types of uh, 
look uh, nanoscopic or microscopic uh, energy absorption mechanisms. So that's why this particular shell is very effective in terms of uh, uh, absorbing energy as well as localizing the damage um, particular shell. Um, we, there are also uh, other, uh, in this particular shell, there are other mechanisms, um, which is also, uh, I would say, very important. Uh, in, in another work, we, we, uh, we discovered that um, this shell is not a simple laminate. Um, I, I, I have to uh, ping pong that uh, racket. So usually when you have a, a layered uh, composite, right? So you have one layer uh, stacked on top of each other and then uh, you, you get a, a laminate structure, right? Um, so when you have this, this kind of material, um, the, uh, the deformation can easily go through the interface because the interface is usually weaker. So that means in this case, uh, the damage can, uh, can uh, propagate into a large area. That's not good. That's actually a big issue for fiber composites. Usually people talk about delamination, right? Delamination meaning that the interface between the laminates start to open, start to, to fail. So in this shell, in this placuna placenta shell, so the, the layers uh, are not a simple, uh, simply stacked on top of each other. Instead, the adjacent layers are merged into, uh, into the, their adjacent ones um, through what we call connection centers. So those connection centers are actually uh, 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 mineral structures which, uh, where you can consider the two layers are grown together. Uh, so then you can imagine that uh, when the crack propagates through the interface, when the crack encounters a connection center, it, it has to be stopped, or it, it has to break the layer in, in order to uh, continue to, to, to propagate. And, and with that, then um, the, the damage can be localized. Right? So, um, at the same time, it can dissipate energy through the crack, through the, uh, the interfacial opening, and then deflects through, uh, to another layer. So it involves more material to, to deform in the localized area. Right, so this mm -hmm. is a very effective in terms of uh, uh, really localized damage as well as uh, absorbing energy. We, we made um, some bound inspired um, uh, laminate structures, uh, which is still ongoing, but you can clearly see this kind of uh, design can, can localize the damage um, very effectively. But I'm just asking about the design process. How do you approach the design process if you have this kind of I don't know if you have any other examples you still in your mind that it's really hard to design that in the lab or in the material level. Yeah. And what is that strategy to think about the design process? How do, you, for example, damage localization is very interesting the way the delamination, the void. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is the design process for you to think about the problem and how to approach design? Yeah, so I, I think there are a couple of uh, uh, aspects that we definitely need to keep in mind when we so-called translating what we learn from biological system to a, a real material system. Um, so first of all, uh, I would say um, we cannot uh, f just completely copy um, what, what, what we saw in, in uh, biological systems. Um, first of all, it's, it's very hard um, uh, to copy different length scales, structural features. Um, it is almost impossible um, at this moment. Uh, second is um, um, it's very very costly to 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 do that uh, to to copy different lens scale from nano to 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 high to 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 microscopic. So if that that means we have to select, we have to be very uh, selective in terms of copying which structural feature uh, you th we think is most effective. Um, and the other uh, aspect uh, that we need to consider, I think, is to uh, we need to uh, consider the scal scalability or ma manufacturability. Um, now, I would say with uh, with three D printing, right? So people can can easily uh, realize or materialize um, different kind of uh, designs. Um, but the real question is, um, is that material, uh, let's say three D printed, really uh, useful? 
or can we really use that materials for, for our practical applications? So how does that compare with conventional structural materials? Let's say steels or concrete or wood, for example, right? Uh, it's, it's good to demonstrate the design ideas as, uh, with modeling, with 3D printing. But um, we, we also need to think about, is it really uh, applicable for practical applications? In that case, um, we have to, uh, in my opinion, uh, it will be, be nice to combine the design strategies with some established or, or more conventional fabrication uh, method so that you can directly utilize the, the established processing uh, to make a materials which can be potentially uh, uh, useful or, or, or used in real applications instead of for, uh, uh, for uh, demonstration. Uh, of course, the, it, it, there, 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 um, there are significance in terms of, uh, for dem demonstration, right? You wanted, we can uh, understand the design principles, but for real applications, uh, in my opinion, uh, it'll be it'll be nice to 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 combine the design lessons that we learned from nature with some uh, um, some well established fabrication. Um, so we are we are trying to work on that. For example, we we use um, uh, uh, the the uh, the 3D printing combined with uh, centrifugal casting. So casting is a very very uh, traditional method uh, of fabricating uh, metal-based uh, materials. Uh, so we're, we're working on that. Um, we're also using slip, slip casting uh, to make ceramic materials. Those is also very traditional processing. Um, so those, those process uh, technologies are very, very uh, well established. Uh, you can make very large materials structures. If we can uh, so-called reinvent uh, those, those methods, by incorporating some, some design strategies that we learned from nature, and then we can maybe produce some, some materials which can, can be immediately used. So that's our uh, goal, I would say, uh, for, <laughs> for in terms of uh, bio-inspired uh, fabrication. Great. I don't know if you have encountered maybe any architecture or design in nature, and maybe sound is useless to you, and after that you figure out that was very interesting, and maybe, because sometimes that's a counterintuitive um, vision that maybe this is useless, but then you figure out this has a deep meaning in this way, this design or architecture, maybe in evolution, in nature, or maybe in a work you did. Um, yeah, I, I think, um, when, whenever I have those kind of uh, uh, situations, I, I I would tell myself that oh I, I don't fully understand the problem yet. <laughs> so, um, um, but I I do think yes in nature there are some uh, some uh, structural features maybe um, they are not that uh, mechanically significant. People tend to um, I mean in our field right so. We tend to uh, observe, observe a structure and then uh, look at their mechanical properties and then try to make a link, right? Make a link between this structure and and the property. Um, but but um, in this process, uh, sometimes we we tend to um, I, I would say too focused on this on this relationship, right? But in reality, um, maybe this structural feature is not for a mechanical purpose, right? So, mm -hmm. so this link may be not that strong. Um, maybe that structural feature is for other forms. Maybe it's just a, a remnants of a growth product. Um, so in this case, um, um, I would say uh, this kind of relation, a uh, structure property relationship, um, is is not that strong. Maybe we just don't fully understand the problem. Um, so we uh, we 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 uh, have a work uh, looking at the uh, the mechanics optics uh, coupling between uh, uh, in in a, in a skeleton of a, a of a bug. Uh, this beetle is called a, a flower uh, flower beetle. Um, it, you know the 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 beetles usually very colorful, right? And it has this uh, this uh, elytra very colorful. But at the same time, those uh, skeleton, 
uh, need to provide protection for the animal. Uh, so arthropods, the, the, the beetle, they don't have internal bones. They have the um, external, so-called exoskeleton to protect themselves. So now you have a, you have a, 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 a du at least dual scale, a dual, dual functional requirement, mechanics and optics. Then the question is, if you look at the microstructure, right? So is, is this structure going uh, optimized for mechanics or, or, or if we just focus our discussion in the mechanics, maybe we will reach a conclusion that, oh, this structure is, is great for, for mechanics. But, but maybe that's not true, right? <laughs> that's not the full picture. Um, so, so in this work, we, uh, we, we look at uh, how this structure uh, uh, features affect both mechanics and optics. And so we found that, oh, this structure may be more, in, during the evolution, maybe it's more optimized in terms of optics instead of mechanics. Um, so this kind of study, I think, is, is important uh, to look, look at the biological materials in different perspectives. Um, because in general, I would say biological materials are intrinsically multifunctional. Um, so they're not produced for a single purpose. Um, so, so that will dictate and will, will, will make, it will have direct influence uh, in terms of how the material is constructed. So maybe a structural feature is, is useless here, right? Um, but, um, but maybe it's, it's critical <laughs> in, in, that, yeah. in, in another aspect. So, um, and, and, uh, and in this problem, I, I was consider this problem is open, right? So we, we, uh, we don't know, we are not the, the algorithm. We, we cannot um, as it derive a, a, a optimization function for that animal. <coughs> we don't know which one is more important. Um, there are also a hidden <laughs> functional requirements. So um, yeah, um, it's hard to, 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 to make this relationship, uh, to say, oh, this structural feature is for this, it's great for this. Um, um, yeah, we, we need to be aware of this. <laughs> Another example of that case, because sometimes if you work on something, it opens you to interesting explanation and theory that maybe you weren't aware of. Yeah. There's also other yeah. examples. So, so Currently, um, uh, we're, we're very interested in porous materials uh, in the group, uh, how nature makes uh, uh, lightweight porous materials. Um, I would say uh, nature is, is a great, uh, in terms of this, making very complex porous structure. It, it goes back to uh, Hook, right? Uh, Hook's very, very first microscopic uh, uh, view of, uh, of some, some structures from nature, including some wood, right? So the, um, he draws those cellular structures from the wood. Um, so the, and then later on, we have a very, uh, very comprehensive uh, work from uh, Ashby and Gibson looking at the different types of wood, their cellular structures. Um, how wood is able to be uh, so lightweight but strong and and, damp and, and tough. So we have been uh, uh, trying to continue the study uh, on biological cellular materials uh, by looking at um, a special group where they have um, high mineral content. Um, so so wood um, is a cellular material, but it's uh, entirely organic, entirely polymeric. Um, in that case, uh, it's primarily composed of cellulars. So we are interested in um, porous materials uh, uh, made of minerals. Uh, so there, there, are there, there are not many uh, examples in nature in comparison to, let's say, the wood or plants, but, but there are some, some excellent, I would say, <laughs> Excellent examples of uh, how nature make a complex biomineral structures. Uh, so mm -hmm. the examples include uh, sea urchins uh, and canadums, sea urchins, starfish. Um, we also look at the uh, the cuttlefish, uh, the, the internal skeleton yeah. of cuttlefish, which is called cuttle bone, which is a highly porous material. Um, and also, uh, uh, yeah, starfish, um, uh, sponges, um, uh, which is silica-based uh, porous material. Um, we have made some, some good uh, uh, discoveries uh, in this area, um, how nature make porous, uh, but um, mineralized structure, uh, which is stiff and, and, and tough.
because uh, this is very challenging actually uh, in, in engineering. How do you make a ceramic porous materials which is damage tolerant? Uh, the, the challenge is that um, the mineral or the ceramic is very brittle. And, and when, you make the, when you make the ceramic porous, you, um, very often you are going to have a lot of defects, um, uh, notches, uh, surface roughness inside the structure. So that's why um, the, the uh, porous ceramic material are very, very weak, very, very brittle. Um, that's why in packaging, let's, uh, we use foams. We, uh, we, those are usually uh, polymer-based or sometimes metal-based. We never use ceramic, ceramic foams for, for packaging, for cushion, no. <laughs> Although uh, ceramic, uh, ceramic foams is, is good in terms of, for example, it's very high temperature resistance, it's very stable, but it's just too weak. Um, um, but nature, um, like uh, sea urchins, uh, starfish, uh, or cuttlefish, they, they make very strong and damage tolerant ceramic uh, foams. Um, the reason is because they, ha they have very nice control in terms of their microstructure, in terms of their porosity, um, and also, of course, the internal microstructure. Uh, for example, the, the cuttle bone. The cuttlefish um, is, a, is a great <laughs> model system for bioinspiration, right? People study their skins, just study their, their swimming, uh, study their, their eyes. Um, uh, but here we study their skeleton. <laughs> so uh, so they, inside of the cuttlefish, there's a skeleton, uh, mineralized, very, very stiff skeleton. Um, it's called a cuttle bone. Um, and and a cuttlefish is is a is a shell. It's a mollusk. A mollusk is not a is not a fish, uh, but but its shell is inside. So that uh, so it's internal. It's different from other mollusk, um, and that's called a cuttle bone. That cuttle bone is very porous, and ninety three of ninety three percent of the of the structure is a, a, is hollow, and um, and inside this hollow structure. Um, the animal can control the uh, water in and out into this uh, structure so that it can control the relative density of this porous structure and hence the, the entire body so that the cuttlefish can go up and down in the water column to go up and deep. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's almost like a uh, swimming blender, like a blender uh, for fish, but it's just uh, just a rigid blender. Um, the people call this a uh, rigid buoyancy tank. Uh, this is like a submarine, right? So it can control the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the relative density to go up and down. Um, and then you can imagine that this structure needs to be very stiff because you have a very high water pressure, uh, uh, which can potentially implode this ho this hollow structure, right? If it's not strong, it's just crushed by the water pressure. Right? So, uh, so it has a very intriguing uh, complex internal structure where you have the layered. Uh, uh, it's like a, a multi-story floor, multi-story uh, building. So you have uh, floors, uh, ceilings, and pillars, uh, the walls to support uh, the ceilings. Um, of course, they're all in the microscopic level. Then the uh, uh, the way the the animal designed the walls is is very very uh, intriguing. It's not like the wall that we have, where you have a uh, uh, straight uh, from bottom to top. Um, it's almost like that, but there are modifications. So the walls are are, are curved um, and wavy, and it has a complex pattern. Um, and also the the wall, uh, they change their orientations from the the floor to the ceiling. Uh, by doing that, it can control the stress distribution within the structure. Uh, so that uh, if, if the stress level is, is too high, it can control the location of failure. Um, um, pr primarily in, in the middle of the wall. So it, it doesn't happen at the ceiling or at the, at the bottom, uh, at the floor. The middle of the wall, so that uh, the ceiling and and the floor are still intact. And then, if the stress is still high enough, it can uh, compress the ceiling to the floor. Um, and in this case, it can protect 
the 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 ceiling or the floor because each each story or each chamber is completely sealed from the nest, uh, from from the adjacent chamber. That means if this chamber, if this floor, the uh, floor seven is is broken, then floor six is still okay. It's still in. Yeah, so it still can hold the 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 uh, the gas uh, to to provide the the uh, buoyancy. It doesn't collapse the entire building. So that's that's very clever. Um, so uh, we, yeah, we have been looking at their uh, their structure and their mechanics, how they uh, they they they're able to achieve this uh, damage tolerance with with mm -hmm. uh, a very high mineral content. This structure is completely I was completely made of aragonite, um, there's several percent of organics. So very brittle material, <coughs> but very damage tolerant. I'm blown away by your description. I wasn't really aware of the details, but the way you describe it, I think we have we have episode about cuttlefish, all the details, because it's very, really, oh, yeah. really inspiring. I wasn't really aware how yeah. it's really so beautiful and intricate yeah. and complex and intelligent. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, I think it, I would say this is the excellent example showing how nature is able to uh, to control the structure of very simple uh, uh, material, starting <coughs> material. It's, if you if you look at the aragonite from nature, from geology, those are very like prisms, like uh, red, usually red color uh, prisms, like structure, very simple, um, very brittle. But uh, but somehow <laughs> we're we're interested in their formation as well. But um, yeah, they they form this very complex uh, structure, so that they they have these mechanical uh, properties as well as uh, the uh, uh, the fluid uh, property, right? So the these structure need to be open uh, in the sense that um, it allows the fluid to go inside of the structure, uh, so that it can control the relative density. Um, so th th there are multiple requirements uh, in inside of this structure. So that if you look at the the cuttlebone in different areas, they have a different structural design. We think that maybe because um, in different regions uh, the the functional uh, hierarchy or the importance of different functions are are different. Uh, maybe in this in the opening region, it's more important for the fluid transport. So you so the structure need to guide the the flow of the fluid, but in the in the majority or in the later in the in the in the posterior part maybe is is more uh, important for the uh, mechanical strength. Um, it is is uh, it's amazing. Uh, look at those kind of structures. Yeah, I agree with you. Maybe follow up question here about the design because. <laughs> When we just try to design structure, structure like that, do you think we have to go to the smallest scale and do this kind of complex design when we go into the continuum level? Because there is two ways to do that, either in the material level or just going to structure. In that case, do you think um, to which one could be effective or giving, or maybe it's, or both are the same? I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, so... I think it's very hard to answer uh, the question which one is more important. Um, uh, for example, uh, um, when we talk about energy absorption uh, uh, of a material, um, it's hard to decouple the material level and uh, composite level or the actual ar architectural level. Um, uh, what what is the contribution from each uh, each level? It's very hard to decouple that. Um, I, in my opinion, I, I think is is uh, is 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 beneficial to look at both. Um, so mm. both levels um, are important, and it's definitely worth to 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 uh, investigate. But um, the challenge challenge is how to how do you bring uh, the two together. Um, we we in the in the in the research field uh, we have uh, excellent works in in uh, in this both both directions right um, people can fabricate uh, 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 bio inspired minerals uh, uh, for example calcite uh, calcite crystals incorporating some some organic materials inside um, uh, those show, those have been shown. 
to have good mechanical properties in compar in comparison to uh, pure calcite. Mm -hmm. uh, on the compo composite level, there are a lot of works to show that uh, if you make, uh, for example, nacre-like structures, or uh, bone-like structures, they have uh, better mechanical properties. That kind of work, um, the uh, the uh, the uh, the control, the, the structural control at the individual building block level is le less considered, right? So combining the two uh, will be will be uh, will be um, uh, beneficial. I think that's one of the directions uh, in, in our field we should uh, definitely look into that. Since uh, we're close to the end, I have a few questions. Maybe the first one, I think, in soft robotics, we speak about should we design the whole soft robot soft completely? And if it is rigid, do we still call soft robotic? Or it's kind of the debate in the field. But I'm just ask you when you look to evolution, some creature already fully soft and and, and easily damaged. And why do you think this kind of selection of the seashell have this combination hard and soft to do the trick to say to make the protect themselves and also the fish and etc. and some creature fully soft and easily damaged. Do you think there's a reason for that? <laughs> this is a very hard question. So uh, like the evolutionary advantages of, uh, of uh, <clears throat> armor, right? Having a hard armor or a skeleton. I, I would say uh, definitely there, there is, uh, there, there, in my opinion, right? So uh, <clears throat> I'm not evolutionary uh, accurate, but in my opinion, there are, there, there are there, there are advantages of having uh, hard skeletons, um, hard protective armors. Um, um, so that's why, uh, in my opinion, that's why you have this uh, in the Cambrian uh, period, right? You have this uh, sudden explosion of uh, of a of animals or organisms which start to develop uh, uh, hard tissues. Um, mm. So there should be a. a evolutionary pressure or selection pressure of having those uh, armors. Um, in terms of the context of a soft robotics, uh, in my opinion, um, um, I think it will be beneficial to incorporate the hard elements uh, into the, uh, the uh, uh, so-called bi-inspired soft robotics um, because uh, there, 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 there are many. There are a lot of uh, examples of that in, in nature. For example, if you look at, um, if you look at the uh, starfish, uh, right? Starfish, uh, you can consider is as a is pretty soft. It's is pretty sloppy. Um, um, it, it can move, right? Um, but 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 inside the starfish skeleton, uh, inside the starfish body, there's a there's a skeleton system. Which are made of uh, hard um, uh, mineralized particles. Uh, those are called ossicles. So those ossicles uh, are uh, assembled inside this uh, soft body, and 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 each particle uh, are are connected with the soft fiber, so that the fiber can 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 regulate or control the movement of, of the relative most uh, position of the individual particles. And then uh, once the uh, and also the animal has a capability of uh, of locking the position of the particles by uh, through a chemical process uh, on the fibers, so the fiber can stiffen um, the the uh, themselves. Once they let's say if you hold the uh, starfish, um, the starfish become very rigid, so it's it's, it's very rigid. Because in that case, uh, the, the fibers are, are stiffened uh, through, through a chemical process. Mm -hmm. So you get a, 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 a very good transition from ability to a rigid uh, architecture. So um, in my opinion, very often uh, robotics need to achieve this, uh, this, this, this uh, uh, functionality, right? Uh, sometimes you want to move, you want to squeeze into a hole, in that case, you, you want a relative motion um, mm -hmm. of the material, but sometimes you want to grab something. Uh, or that's, I'm not a ro ro robotics person, but that's just based on my uh, understanding. So um, having a capability of trans uh, translating from a soft to hard, I think is beneficial. And nature does that through a combination of soft and hard material. So another question about, I think, about the dead fish swimming upstream. The question is how 
certain structure like that without any brain can exhibit intelligence through coupling the geometric nonlinearities of the fish and the material nonlinearities in the environment. How do you see this com the coupling of geometric and material nonlinearities without the brain to achieve interesting functionality or behavior like the dead fish is swimming upstream? It's, it's a great question to, to think about, right? So how uh, uh, a behavior, how a certain behavior uh, plus some, some structures, um, um, how to achieve uh, a, a, a particular biological, uh, let's say, a mo locomotion or a protective reaction. Yeah, we, we, we have seen, uh, for example, the, the, the example uh, that I uh, shared, the, uh, the chitin, which has eyes, right? So um, the, the, we, uh, we have a biologist, uh, biology collaborators, um, Daniel Spicer, um, Dr. Spicer, he, he conducted uh, behavioral studies to show that uh, the animal can react as if you play, uh, place an object on top of the animal, the animal can react to clap onto the substrate so that it can protect uh, from dislodging from the, from the rocks. Yeah, it's, it's intriguing. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I don't know um, wh whether mollusk, um, like a shell, has a brain or not, right? So, but but um, yeah. somehow, uh, the, through the eyes, it sees the object, it triggers some reaction, right? So, um, and, and in this case, the, the eyes, there, there are hundreds of eyes distributed in the shell. So mm -hmm. how the animal process in the information, right? Uh, maybe some eyes see the object or some eyes are not, right? So if there is a threshold of, uh, of a triggering, right? So uh, do I need to have three, at least three eyes to see the object in order to trigger the reaction or not? So mm -hmm. yeah, the, that, that, that's kind of uh, like, uh, the, the, the integration of the material and the res be animal behavior and also the geometry, yeah, like you said, the, the geometry. So the, the animal has a, like, uh, a, a, almost like a dome-like structure. So the eyes are pointing to different directions. Um, so how those, uh, those different aspects are integrated to, uh, and finally lead to the animal behavior response, I, yeah, that's, that's, that's a great, great direction, I, I would say. Um, currently, um, we don't have uh, um, too much work on that, but uh, yes, uh, this, this is a great, uh, to really look at the, uh, like the rules of life, right? So how, how, how nature um, process the information through uh, different uh, structures. Uh, I just ask you what could be other challenges. You mentioned fabrication at the beginning that how it's hard really to get certain design exactly intricate like the nature. For you, what are the challenges with the fabrication? What are the key challenges you think we need to give more attention, maybe in the field? We need to more do more in this direction. Um, there, there, one challenge, in my opinion, is the, um, it's always a balance of, uh, um, when we look at the biological materials, it's always a, a trade-off between uh, in-depth and the and also the broadness. Um, so currently we're very good at um, looking at one system very, in a very detail. Right? So uh, <coughs> from nanometer scale up to the macroscopic scale and, and what are the mechanical properties uh, correspondingly. Um, but um, there, there are a lot of systems, there, there are a lot of organ, uh, organisms in, in nature. Um, uh, how can we increase the stretch, uh, uh, throughput of, uh, of, of conducting this kind of research? Uh, I think th this, is, uh, this is a very big challenge uh, for me because um, um, I think it will be beneficial to, to compare different, let's say, different monarch systems, right? Uh, there are shell structures, um, not superficially, but um, in a very detailed way uh, from, from uh, small scale to the upper scale. I think mm -hmm. there, there, there is a significance to that, in both in terms of uh, um, bio-inspired design uh, and also from evolution, right? So is there a pattern uh, um, in terms of microstructure, right? So we see the phylogeny. Uh, we, can, we can look at the from the genetic point of view, right? But um, on the material level, right, on the material level, um, uh, 
how how a particular struct microstructure is converged or diverse uh, diversify. I think that that's that, that's fascinating to 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 do. But it's it's a great challenge, right? So how can we can we increase increase this threshold? Um, can we can we do electron microscopy for thousands of species very very effectively? Um, so that's a big challenge. Um, the the other challenge um, I think is. Um, is really how how nature how organisms produce uh, uh, or control the structure in three D. Can we monitor uh, or track uh, the uh, the evolution of the microstructure in three D in real time? So now we we are we're very good at in studying the final fully formed structures, right? Uh, we know nature is a brick and mortar structure. We know bone. We know. But but how the structure is formed uh, in, in in real time in three especially in three D can we track that um, at the building block level how individual building blocks are deposited how they grow how they merge how they assemble um, I think that that's important um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, bioinspired processing can we follow our, uh, uh, the the similar uh, uh, Growth process to make bioinspired materials. Uh, I mean, this this is this is this is a, a big challenge. Uh, the, 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 there's another challenge, uh, in my opinion, is um, a, um, a quantitative, a 3D uh, uh, description of uh, materials is also a, a big challenge. Um, I mean, this is not just for biological materials, for 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 synthetic, for engineering materials. Um, Characterizing the material in 3D quantitatively, can can we track? Uh, can we me mon uh, measure, for example, the distribution of the grain orientations uh, in, in a bulk a bulk material? Um, uh, what what is the geometry of the individual uh, grains? What what is the what is structure between the grain boundaries? So the the same uh, uh, same questions apply for biological materials, and 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 it's even more complex, I would say, for biological materials. You have a complex building blocks um, organized in, in 3D. Um, how can we uh, uh, study their structure uh, in, uh, quantitatively? For example, the, the nacre, right? The nacre uh, is a very common, uh, apparently it's a very simple structure, right? So you have uh, mineral layers uh, stacked on top of each other. But uh, there are more, uh, it, 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 there's more <laughs> a subtle uh, designs uh, in, uh, than that, right? So, so each template they ha they 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 have a different geometries. The surface uh, there is not smooth, right? Uh, the alignment of the of the uh, the alignment of the adjacent uh, mineral uh, building blocks, all uh, right. So those kind of information in three D in bulk like, uh, level is is uh, is lacking. Uh, we we don't have a good way. Uh, to do that, uh, it's very challenging. They're in the microscopic level. Um, they're complex in 3D. Um, they're fully mineralized. Um, you don't have a good contrast. Let's if you use, for example, uh, micro CT, you will not be able to see the contrast between the individual building blocks because they're they're just so close. They're just completely mineralized. There's there's no contrast. So that that's a big. Uh, uh, big limitation, uh, big challenge. Uh, if we cannot fully understand how the structure is constructed in 3D, I don't think um, we can effectively mimic those structures. Uh, not mentioning uh, so some very complex, for example, there are some, some st structure, they have a complex helical fibers mm -hmm. uh, uh, assembled together. Uh, so that's much more complex than a simple brick and mortar. How, how the fibers are assembled in, in, in 3D. Uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it, we don't know. <laughs> it's very interesting. Maybe I lost a question about the growth um, in material. How do you see combining biological material that has functionality to grow and heal with absolutely artificial material or passive material? How do you see we can combine biological material with passive or maybe smart material? Do you think how this can be done to the growth feature, for example? I think that's something we speak about cost. Uh, some people speak about cost. It's, it's still a challenging 
to know to do mature the goal. Yeah, I think that that's a, a, a great great uh, I was great direction to go um, in, in terms of combining the two. Um, so there there are definitely limitations, right? So um, in terms of the potential applications of these kind of materials. Um, um, can we grow a material which can as a directly use for structural applications uh, if we compare uh, with concrete or other kind of material? I think there are definitely limitations. But for other, for example, maybe for biomedical um, mm. applications um, or other applications, it, it, it may have a great potential. In terms of um, how to how to utilize, you know, how to construct this, this platform, right? Uh, combining biology uh, uh, or biomodernization with uh, some synthetic. Yeah, I think there's, there are some potential if, if we can uh, uh, harness uh, the, I say some biomodernization uh, organisms, uh, for example, some bacteria, or, um, maybe some, some uh, I don't know the some some sponges or some animals uh, in terms of the, the if they have the capability of biomodernization and then combine with uh, as a three D printed scaffold right and then you can regulate uh, where the mineral uh, is deposited um, how how the mineral is deposited uh, I think that yes that that will be uh, that will be definitely uh, uh, beneficial then. You can produce a material almost automatically, right? Without uh, without uh, uh, external control, um, this is a great. Yeah, this is great. But um, yeah, I haven't seen too much work on here. But yeah, this is this is great. So you you get uh, you 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 harness the 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 uh, autonomous growth. Um, and also self-heating of the biology, biology aspect, but at the same time, you definitely control or guide the, this, the formation for a particular uh, application. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's uh, people have done uh, some, some simple forms. For example, people can harness the um, uh, sea urchin uh, embryonic cells, uh, which can, uh, which can uh, form minerals in, in vitro, um, but um, that those materials, uh, those bio minerals are not um, for a particular application purpose. And so those studies are primarily uh, motivated by looking at how the mineral are deposited, how the mineral are formed. But how can we harness those processes to make functional materials? Yeah, it's a great, uh, great direction to go. Um, yeah, very, very good. Very, very good point. Yeah. So final question, what is your aspiration? Yeah, and what you do, what is next? What's your aspiration? Um, my aspiration? I would say it's a, it's a question, right? So it's, it's the, it's the um, whenever I, I, you look at a, a plant, an animal, or a skeleton, um, the, for me, is uh, I always ask why, right? Why, how, how the structure is constructed? Uh, why the, this is in this form? Um, mm. You can find a, a, a research question in almost any uh, systems um, surrounding you. Uh, so this is uh, this is why I think um, the research in this field, in this sort of bio, biological bio inspired materials, I think this is why it's so uh, attractive to me. Um, mm. There are endless uh, questions actually. There are endless questions that you can ask. Um, uh, so whenever I walk in, into my yard, um, you can you can just walk. You can look at, for example, the pie cones, the flowers, <laughs> uh, the honeybees, right? So there there are a lot of questions that you can ask. Um, um, how nature uh, makes uh, those functional materials with simple uh, simple materials, simple minerals, uh, simple organics. Um, so. 
yeah, it, it keeps me uh, thinking. Um, so there, there are a lot of questions. And um, the more <laughs> you look and the more uh, questions will come up, right? So uh, you study fish, uh, for example, we study fish teeth, how the teeth uh, is able to achieve uh, certain functionality. But when you, when, when, when you look into that, when you, when you think you solve the problem, oh, this structure, this particular structure, um, um, uh, fulfills uh, or achieve this particular uh, property, right? But then the question is how, how that uh, structure uh, uh, developed, right? How that particular structure is formed? Why uh, you have a particular doping of a particular composition in, in a certain area? How is that achieved? So there, there are more questions uh, keeping, <laughs> keep, to, <laughs> keep coming up. So. Uh, I would say that's that's always uh, 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 a good aspect uh, uh, for for this. And it's always nice to uh, to keep asking the question. And um, and another good thing uh, for this is um, for this research, I would say is um, you you can make a very good connections to uh, to nature uh, with. Um, and it's also very good to inspire um, uh, young kids. I, I, I have two uh, kids, uh, five and seven. Um, yeah, so it's, they, they always ask the question, right? So uh, why this shell is, is this color, right? So why this shell is, 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 is big or it has this certain shape, right? So uh, you can make a very good connections um, uh, through those uh, those uh, natural materials uh, w with the kids. Um, I think it, that's also uh, a good, uh, uh, very, very nice aspect of, of, of this research. Um, yeah, yeah, in my opinion. Again, I, I found what you do very inspiring, and I can also see how you are so passionate about what you're doing, and that's something very admirable. I, I really enjoyed everything you said, and it was very, very, very interesting. I don't know if you have any final words you would like to say for people listening or the robotics community. Any final words you would like to say? Um, so, yeah, um, I'm, I'm really uh, glad to be here uh, to share our work. Um, it's, it's, it's been very nice. Uh, yeah, um, I rarely... Uh, usually, our field, uh, we, uh, we we're primarily in materials field, right? So we um, uh, either in biomedication or bioinspired materials or in materials in general. Um, yeah, so it's, it's great to, to interact with uh, people from different uh, uh, fields. Uh, I'm in the mechanical engineering department. We have a lot of uh, robotics uh, 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 faculty in the department. It's it's always too um, nice to to talk to talk with them, um, so uh, to to look at uh, how they make um, uh, a bone inspired let's say tails legs. Uh, it's very nice to see. Um, um, so yeah, um, it, it, I'm I'm very glad to be here. Um, I I would say um, the material the material uh, questions uh, in in robotics in software, but in my opinion. Um, can provide some, some uh, advantages or some potential solutions. Uh, as always, for robotics, you, is, you, we always have the problem, right? So the uh, how you control the, uh, as, a, the uh, as we talked, the stiffness versus flexibility, right? So the uh, uh, and and other uh, other aspects, right? So nature definitely provides a lot of answer potential answers. Um, how to make lightweight materials, right? Uh, it, it's important. Uh, I remember this when I talked to um, uh, a professor who is a, a robotic expert. Uh, I asked him, uh, so in terms of materials uh, for robotics, what, what do you think the, the, the most challenging uh, uh, aspect? Uh, what kind of materials that you, you like to have? Right, so the, the the first one that he the, the professor mentioned was uh, lightweight materials. Um, how do you make a, a material lightweight? Uh, is important, right? If you want to have a flying ro robot, right? Um, or you want to have a robot to 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 uh, to run fast. So yeah, um, I would say it, it, uh, 
materials from nature definitely provides a lot of lessons uh, uh, for us to not only studying uh, to make new materials, but uh, also the materials uh, on a system level to uh, for uh, robots for for bonds by robots. Uh, um, so, yeah, uh, very glad to be here. Uh, I, I, I'm really looking forward to, to, to have more, uh, I would say, uh, interactions with uh, people uh, from, for example, robotics. I think uh, uh, perspective from, uh, uh, from different fields uh, is the key, right? So it is the key, <coughs> the diversity, uh, the diverse uh, perspective uh, to address a, a problem is, is the key to, to uh, for, for successful uh, research. Again, thank you so much, Leng. It was such a pleasure and very, very inspiring to listen to you. Uh, really appreciate your time. Thanks thank so you. much. Thank you, Mava. This is a great opportunity uh, for me as well uh, for, for, for to, to, to share our research to a broader uh, communi community. Um, so yeah, thank you for, the, for, for this. Uh, it's, it's very nice. And also, I would say, we should uh, thank you for 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 doing this uh, for for three thank you. for three years. Um, thank you. Yeah. So um, yeah, I would definitely encourage um, uh, my students, uh, my class, to 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 go to your uh, po podcast. I think this this is uh, definitely nice to 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 thank you. yeah to to hear different uh, people uh, talking about their research. Uh, I think this is this is nice.